Okay, welcome back class, and today we're going to start section three of um, looking at graphs of linear functions and, and uh, linear systems. Okay, so in this section here, we're going to talk about systems of linear equations in, in two variables. And so that means we're going to be talking about two or more equations. So we're going to use, uh, we'll first of all, learn how to decide whether an ordered pair is a solution of a linear system. Uh, we're going to so, uh, learn how to solve uh, linear systems by using graphing. Uh, also solve linear systems by substitution. And there's also uh, solving linear systems by what they call addition, but it's also termed uh, using uh, by elimination. Okay, because you're eliminating one of the variables. Okay, um, five, we're going to learn to identify systems that do not have exactly one solution, um, which means one ordered pair. So there may be more than one, or there may be no uh, solution. So we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to solve problems using uh, linear uh, si using systems of linear equations as well. Okay, so now two linear equations are called a system of linear equations, or we just call it a linear system. Now, a solution to a system of linear equations in two variables. Okay, so we're talking about two x and y. Okay, so we're talking about two var two variables with uh, two equations with two unknowns is an ordered pair that satisfies both equations. So we talked about what we mean by a solution of one equation, which is an ordered pair that satisfies that equation. But now we're going to say, hey, we have an ordered pair that satisfies both equations in a system, then that's a solution of the system. So in this case here, we want to determine, hey, whether 1 comma 2 is a solution of the system. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in 1 and 2 into both of them and see if we get a true statement in both cases. So if we plug in 1 here and 2 here, we get what? We get 2 minus 6, and 2 minus 6 gives us negative 4. We get negative 4 equal to negative 4, which is true. Or in this case here, we plug in 1 here, and 2 here, we get 1 times 2 is 2, plus what? 2 equals 4. We get 4 is equal to 4, which is also a true statement. Okay, And so this proves that they are, that 1 comma 2 is a solution of the system, and that's what this here we do. Okay, so that's what we did. Okay, so we can see that it is indeed a solution to the system. Now, for a system with one solution, the coordinates of the point of intersection, right? So for a system with one solution, it represents the intersection point of the two lines. Okay? So this basically, the solution, the one point, represents where the two lines intersect. So now we can solve by graphing these two equations, right? So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to graph them. And so the solution is going to be where the two graphs cross. Whatever point that they cross at, that is going to be the solution to the system. So we take these two equations, okay? And how are we going to solve this? Well, we can find the solution by graphing both of them on the same rectangular coordinate plane and then just um, seeing where they intersect. So let's do that. So let's use the intercept method. So here we find the x-intercept is 2 for this one. So x-intercept is at 2 comma 0. The y-intercept is at 0 comma 2 comma 1. So we've got those two points. Okay, and so we're going to graph this using these two points using the blue line. And now we're going to take the second equation, we're going to do the same thing. So the x-intercept is going to be at 6, 0, right? And then the y-intercept 
is going to be at where? At 0, 0,3, right? And we're going to then now use those two points to graph this, the, the, the line of the uh, graph of this equation, and that's going to be represented as a red line. And so now if we look at the graph of these two lines, we see that they intersect right here. And so from the graph, it seems that the, the solution to the system is going to be where? 4, comma, negative 1. Okay, so that's, that's how you do it. Okay, so now you can check this by checking that this is indeed the solution by doing what? By plugging this point into both equations and seeing if you get what? a true statement in both cases. So I'll leave that up to you to do. Okay, but it's very exactly the same thing that we just did in the last example. Now, what about this method called the substitution method? So we've talked about verifying whether a ordered pair is a solution. And we talked about solving a solution of uh, a system by graphing. So now let's look at this method of substitution. Okay, so the way the method of substitution works is you're going to solve either one of the two equations for one variable in terms of the other. So you're just going to solve one of the two equations in terms of y or x. Okay, and one of the two equations may already be in that form. So that, you know, that would be great. And if it is, then you can just skip this step. And then number two is what you're going to do is you're going to take that equation that you solved for, and you're going to substitute the expression found in step one into the other equation, and what will result is you eliminate, well, in, in a manner of speaking, you get rid of one of the two variables. And so what happens is you end up with a, an equation in one variable that's easy to solve. Then step three is you solve that equation containing one variable. And then once you've solved for that one variable, guess what? Now you do what's called back substitute. Now that you've got one of the two variables identified, now all you have to do is plug it back into one of the two equations, right? So you're going to back substitute into the equation that you found in step three into the equation from step one, okay? And then you simplify, and you find the value of the other variable. And then what you do is you check the proposed solution. Uh, you check to see if it is indeed a solution to both systems. So you always want to make sure you check your answer. So let's look at this one. So let's solve this by method of substitution. Okay. So what we're going to do is notice that in this case here, they've already got one of the equations solved for y. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug this in. We're going to substitute in for y here. Oops. So we're going to take y, right, which is equal to this, and we're going to plug it in for y here. So instead of having y here, we're going to basically have a parenthesis, right? So think of this as 4x minus 3 okay, equals 24. Okay, and so what you're going to do is you're going to plug in for y. You're going to substitute in for y. So that means this is going to go in here. And then when you do that, you're just going to have now an equation with just one variable, x. And so that's what we're doing here. And so this is what we end up with right here. And now you can simplify this. Because in a manner of speaking, the y variable has been eliminated. And so now all you have to do is solve for x. And now, once you solve for x, 
And again, make sure you understand the process here. Okay, do this on your own. Make sure you can do it. And then now you get x is equal to 3. Now what you can do is now you can go back to either of the two equations from the beginning and plug in for x and solve for y. So in this case here, now that we know what x is, so we're going to take this equation, y equals negative x minus 1, and now we're going to plug in for x. And so x is 3, so now we're going to get negative 3 minus 1. And now y is equal to negative 4, and so now we're done. Because we've got x is equal to neg is equal to 3, y is equal to negative 4, and our solution is the ordered pair 3 comma negative 4. And now to check this, to verify that this indeed is the solution, we plug it back into our two um, equations. Now, what about this method of addition? or what's also called the method of elimination. So in this case here, what you were going to do is we're going to do a different method that is going to give you the same results. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate one of the variables by multiplying one equation by some constant so that when we add both of the equations together, one of the variables disappears or is eliminated. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to, if necessary, rewrite both equations as the general or, or standard form. AX plus BY equals C. And then two, if necessary, we're going to multiply either equation or both equations by some appropriate, keyword appropriate, non-zero number or numbers so that the sum of the x coefficients or the y coefficients is zero, but not both of them. Okay? We want to try to eliminate one variable. Sometimes you can't. Okay? But we'll talk about that. Now, three says add the equations that we've got in step two. And the sum of an equation is going to be one variable. So it will result in one of the variables being eliminated. And then four, we solve that equation in one variable. And then again, just like in the other method, we back substitute and then we check our solution in the original equations. So let's look at this. So here we've got our example here. Okay, so we've got them in standard form. And so let's look at what we want to eliminate. Okay, so in this case here, they're already written in standard form. So we don't have to do anything like that. Okay, now in this case here, we can't obviously see any, either one of these, if we added these two equations together, nothing's really going to drop out. So we're going to have to multiply these equations by some non-zero number. Okay, now which we have to first decide which variable do we want to get rid of? Do we want to get rid of x or do we want to get rid of y? It really doesn't matter. Okay, it's really just a choice. Now, if we want to get rid of the x values, we're going to have to multiply these one of these or both of these by a number that will give us the same coefficient but opposite signs. Well, if you look at this 9, well, three, 9 is a multiple of 3. So if I multiply this by 3, I'm going to get 9. So to get the opposite value, if I want to eliminate the x's, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this entire equation here by negative 3. Because if I do that, then I'm going to get a negative 9 here. And when I add these equations together, I'm going to get the x's are going to drop out. So we could do that. And so this would become negative 9, negative 8, and negative 96. Or excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, that's going to be negative 3 times 48. Okay. So that's going to be negative uh, what? Um, negative 144. Okay. So we could do that. Now, 
And then when we add these, the x's would go away. Or now I could also multiply by a number by y because look, 8 is a multiple of 2. So I can multiply this by 4 and I'm going to get 8. And then look, this is minus 8. So these are opposite signs already. So I could multiply this whole thing by what? 4. And I get 8 here and I get minus 8 here. And I could add and eliminate the y's. Either way will work. Just make sure you multiply through everything by that constant. Okay? So now, let's see what they did. So here they multiplied by negative 3. So they took the first option. Okay? So you're going to get negative 9x minus 6y is equal to negative 144. And so this one, no change. This doesn't change, right? So now you're going to add these together. The x's go away. And you end up with negative 14y, and you end up with negative 68, 168. So now you're going to divide both sides by negative 14. And when you do that, you get y equals 12. Now you've got the y value. Now you can go back to one of the other two original equations, it doesn't matter which one, and solve for x. And so in this case here, we, they go to this one, the first one. They plug in 12 for y. And then now you solve for x. And so 12 times 2 is 24. You subtract 24 from both sides, and you get 3x is equal to 24. And then you divide both sides by 3, and you get x equals 8, and you're done. And the solution that you end up with is 8, 12. And then, of course, you always have to check and verify that that is indeed a solution to both equations. And I'm going to leave that up to you to do it. Make sure you do it for practice. Now, for linear systems, they could, they, most could have, well, I shouldn't say most, but you'll have systems of equations that will have one solution, like in this example here, or you could have a system of equations that have an infinite number of solutions, which means they never intersect, right? If there's no, or no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, an infinite number of solutions means that they are, they always intersect. They, they intersect at all points, which means they're actually the same line. So when we say that these uh, lines coincide, okay, so that would be this example here. Or you could have a system of equations that has no solutions, and in that case, you would have no intersection, which means, by definition, they would have to be parallel lines, because Parallel lines, by definition, are lines that never intersect. Okay? So those are the only three possible outcomes for a system of two equations with two unknowns. You'll either have exactly one ordered pair solution, which means that the two lines intersect at one point. You'll either have no solution, which means that the two lines are parallel, or you'll have an infinite are infinitely many solutions, which means that they are the exact identical lines. Okay, so they're right on top of each other. So now, if we solve this one, notice that if we try to eliminate one of these, right? So let's multiply the top by 3 and the bottom by negative 2 to eliminate the x's. Okay. Well, look what happens here. If we eliminate the x's, if we eliminate the x's here, we get what? We get no y's either. But we, so we get zero over here. But look what happens over here. We get twelve. Well, is zero equal to twelve? No. Will zero ever be equal to twelve? No. So in in the fact that all the x's and y's go away, it means it doesn't matter what x and y are. This will always be what? False. And so in this case, since we get a false statement, this indicates that there is no solution to the system of equations, which means that what, what we can also say is that the, the, the uh, solution is the empty set, which is the set of nothing. Okay? So there is no solution. We also call this system inconsistent. So if there's no solution, it's also called an inconsistent system. Okay. 
Now, what about this one? Well, first of all, we want to write this in stand, uh, standard form. So we're going to pull everything on one side except for the constant. So we're going to pull this over. Okay. So we'll have y minus 3x is equal to negative 2. Okay. But we could also use this the uh, substitution method too. So if we solve this by substitution, which is what they do, so we're going to substitute, and we get 10 is equal to 10. Now, in this case here, the x and y both go away. But this time, we end up with a true statement. 10 is equal to 10. And 10 will equal 10 no matter what x and y are. So since we end up with a true statement, regardless of what x and y are going to be equal to, this indicates that there are infinitely many solutions. Now, the fact that they use the substitution method just means that they chose a method that was the most convenient, which is what I encourage you to do, uh, unless specifically told to use a particular uh, method. But the elimination method, or the, uh, the method of addition, if you will, and the substitution method will both give you the same answer. But in a lot of cases, one method will stick out as being easier to do than the other. Okay, so in those cases, make sure you use the appropriate method. Okay, so now let's talk about modeling with systems. So making money and losing it. Okay, so we can look at a system of equations by talking about revenue and cost. So you have a business, you sell widgets, right? You're selling something, and there's a cost to making those. You have to buy the materials. You have to pay for employees, unless it's just you doing it yourself. Um, so you have, uh, usually, if it's that case, you have uh, overhead, right? You have a fixed cost, and you have a cost per unit. Okay, so that's the cost function. And then you have a revenue function, which is basically... Um, the amount of money you're going to sell each widget for, right? So the revenue function is just basically going to be very simple. It's going to be the amount of money you're selling it for times the number of widgets you sell. The cost function is going to be a fixed cost, right? That's going to be the cost of um, the uh, you know overhead, electricity, whatever the case may be that doesn't change, right? Rent, um, uh, payroll, things like that. Okay, the cost per unit produced, or what we call the marginal cost, is the cost per unit, which is going to be like, let's say, the material to make the unit, right? So the more units you um, sell, or, or the more units you have to make, the more material you have to use, which means that cost goes up. So there's a cost per unit, okay? So now the point of intersection when it comes to these types of problems, revenue cost function, uh, is going to be what we call the break-even point. So where these two functions intersect is where we call the what we call the break-even point. It's where your profit is zero. Okay, your break-even point. Okay, so now if we look at a company and a company is planning to manufacture radically different wheelchairs, the fixed cost will be five hundred thousand dollars. And it will cost $400 to produce each wheelchair, and each wheelchair is going to be sold for four, uh, $600. Okay. Now, in this case, we want to write the cost function of producing X wheelchairs. So, in this case, we have to recognize what is the cost. What what are we paying to produce one wheelchair? Well, the cost to produce one wheelchair is $400. Okay. But the cost, regardless of the number of wheelchairs we produce, if we don't produce any wheelchairs, if we don't make any wheelchairs, we still have this cost of $500, which is the fixed cost. So we're going to definitely start with $500,000 cost, regardless of the number of wheelchairs we make. Okay, So that's if we, sell, if we make zero wheelchairs. Okay, Now, for every wheelchair we make, it's going to be $400. So that's going to be 400 times X. So the cost function for this for this scenario, for this application, for this problem is going to be five hundred dollars, or excuse me, five hundred thousand dollars plus four hundred dollars times x. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. 
And so in this case here, it's going to be exactly that. Now, what about the revenue function? Well, the revenue function is how much money you're going to make from each wheelchair. So you're selling the wheelchair for $600 each. So your revenue, your total revenue is going to be $600 times the number of wheelchairs you sold. And so it's going to be 600 times X. So these are your cost function. This is your revenue function. And so now remember, the break-even point is where both of these functions are equal. Okay. So the break-even point occurs when the graph of C intersects the graph of R. And thus we can find this by solving the system of these two equations. So how do we do this? Well, easy. Okay. We're going to solve, right? We're going to do this, right? So we can, instead of this, write it like this. Y equals this and Y equals this. Okay. And then, so we're going to use either the elimination uh, or addition method, or we could use the, um, the um, substitution method. And so using substitution, we can substitute in for 600x in for y in the cost function. Okay, so we have 600x is equal to 500,000 plus 400 times x. So notice that these two functions were set equal to each other. Uh -huh. Okay, so by using the substitution method, we get this. And so now we're going to solve for x. So we're going to move 400x over here. So we're going to subtract 400x from both sides. That's going to give us 200x is equal to 500,000. And then if we divide both sides by 200, we get x equals 2,500. And so we would have to sell 2,500 of these wheelchairs to basically break even. Okay. And not lose any money, but not also make any money. Okay. Uh, or as far as profit. Okay, now, if we wanted to find um, the amount of revenue that we would get off of selling 2,500 wheelchairs, we plug this back into our revenue function, right? So we take the function R of 2,500, and we find out that it's going to be 1.5 million. So we'll make a revenue of 1.5 million, and that's going to break us even, okay? And so if we look at it graphically, this is the break-even point right here. So we look at the graph here. This is the, what, our revenue. This is our cost. And notice that this is the break-even. So if we sell less than 2,500 wheelchairs, we're operating at a loss, right? So this shaded region here is the loss, how much money we lost. If we sell more than 25, now we're in the profits. Right, so this is our gain, right? So this vertical difference here is our profit. Here, this negative vertical distance is going to be our negative profit. So remember, profit is is cost minus or excuse me, revenue minus cost. Okay, so it's always revenue minus cost is equal to profit. And so this vertical distance here is our loss because it's going to be a negative profit. Here the vertical distance is positive, so that's going to be our positive uh, profit. Okay. Now the profit, again, just like I said, is the difference between revenue and cost. So this is our profit function. So we can write our profit function equal to revenue minus cost. Okay. So another way of looking at the break-even point is where the difference between revenue and cost is zero so it's where profit is equal to zero right and so we can find the profit function by just basically simplifying our formula here so we plug in our values our functions for r and c and so we simplify this so if we simplify this we get negative 500,000 minus 400x and so our profit function becomes 200x minus 500,000. That's our profit function. And so now we can graph this function and then to find the break-even point it's going to be where the profit is zero. 
right? Because we don't make any money and we don't lose any money. And so again, notice that it crosses the x-axis at 2,500 when x is 2,500 because that's the break-even point. That's where profit is zero. Okay. If we sell less than 2,500 wheelchairs, we're operating in the red, which means we're losing money. If we sell more than 2,500 wheelchairs, we're operating in the black, which means we're good. We're making money. Okay. And so, okay. And so that is the end of our presentation. This is the end of the video, the lecture video. And so remember, please make sure you practice this. Make sure you, you review this. And if you have any questions, please make sure you reach out to me or better yet, bring those questions. If you get stuck on a problem or one of these examples or one of the examples in the textbook, bring it to class. We're going to be working on a lot of this stuff in class, answering questions. And uh, again, this is where that's where going to be where the it's really going to make a difference is in class. OK, but in order to be able to be successful in class, you have to make sure you're watching these videos and make sure you're watching these videos before class so that way you're prepared and you're ready to go. So until next time, have a great day.